Hi everyone, I'm Marsha Lee Valentine. I am currently president and co-founder of the Jamaican Women in Coffee. And we are a chapter to an international organization, International Women's Coffee Alliance. Uh, today, I will be working with both Lily and Gabby to deliver this introduction on TD. Both of, well, all three of us got connected through a upcoming project that we have to develop a curriculum on TD. And my role is to basically work on the case study aspects to find out throughout the region, um, projects that have been implemented that have incorporated TD into their programs and see how well we could apply that to the curriculum that we're currently designing. Um, my interest in TD is basically through the Jamaican Women in Coffee, whereby we apply the principles to ensure that the women farmers that we represent are inclusive in the process and that, oh, the lease back, and that we ensure that practical solutions are presented for them. Lily, you're here. Are you okay? You can hear me now. I can yes. share this Great. slide. Yes. Great. You sound good, Lily. You're you're good, and you're not in the English channel, and we can hear you, so that's good. <laughs> Lily, do you want to get started and introduce the team and start the slides? Yes, please. It's for twenty minutes in. Um, okay. Hi, all. Um, thank you everyone for being here with us today. We're so excited um, to be leading this session and thank you for the patience uh, trying to figure this out. We um, are so excited to have a diverse group of people from all around the world. And so um, learning how to do all the translation and everything. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. So I'm Lily House Peters. Um, I'm an associate professor at California State University, Long Beach. And um, this is here, hopefully you can see our slides. Um, this is our research team. And we are going to be giving um, the foundations, transdisciplinary foundations 101 um, workshop. We envision this as an active workshop, um, as you'll see. So there will be some time for discussion. Um, and I'll go forward in a second. Is Gabriella back in? Um, so our whole team here is uh, also Dr. Gabriela Alonzo Yanez, who should be joining the Zoom hopefully um, in a moment. She's an associate professor at University of Calgary in the Workland School of Education. Um, Marsha Lee Valentine um, with um, Jawick, and you're going to learn a lot more about. Um, Jawick, Jamaican uh, Women in Coffee, and uh, Dr. Martin Garcia Cartagena from Massey University, New Zealand. Um, based on the New Zealand Times, he's not unable to be here uh, live with us today. Um, so a brief um, session introduction, a little bit of housekeeping. This workshop is interactive. Uh, you'll see that there will be some kind of active uh, processes and breakout rooms. We encourage your active participation. Um, it's not required to turn on your camera if you didn't expecting that, but if you feel comfortable uh, having your camera on in the breakout rooms, that's great. Um, but we do, we would love uh, participation, get people kind of talking with each other throughout our session. And one final request that will help us when we go to the breakout rooms is if you could rename rename yourself in Zoom with your name and then the language you feel most comfortable in. For example, um, English is my native language, um, Gabriella, Spanish. Um, so that would just be really helpful so that later when we do the breakout room, um, we can make sure people are kind of in language uh, groups where you'll feel comfortable in chatting. So please take a moment. Uh, to do that. And thank you everyone who's introducing themselves in the chat. Um, this is really exciting to see everyone who's here. And um, as Anna said earlier, 
We actually have or want to promote really quick our two other linked sessions. So on Wednesday, um, if you're interested in transdisciplinarity and seeing what transdisciplinary case studies and research look like, we are going to have a session on Wednesday of this week, Action-Oriented Solutions for Adapting to Global Environmental Change in the Americas, which is going to provide uh, lessons learned and insights from small grant programs that have been going on in the Americas region for the last uh, three years. So please join us for some uh, case studies. And we will also have disciplinary case studies in the part two of this um, session, which will happen on Thursday of this week. So we would love to see you um, back again and learn more about um, additional transdisciplinary research happening across the region and actually across the world on Thursday. Okay, um, so to begin with a few learning objectives upon kind of the completion of this workshop in about an hour and 40 minutes, we hope that as participants, uh, you will feel comfortable being able to describe transdisciplinary research and distinguish it from other forms of collaborative research. So see what's unique about research, identify kind of key tenets um, of conducting transdisciplinary research, especially thinking about designing equitable, inclusive, and ethical environments for effective research collaborations. And finally, uh, to explore some criteria and processes that help to enable and assess successful transdisciplinary research outcomes. So we're going to actually start with a short icebreaker. And I'm going to put this link um, in the chat. So let me um, do that real quick. Um, Okay, I'm going to put the link directly in the chat and then I will start sharing again. So, this is the photo link. Okay. Then, Okay, so if you could please um, go to the first poll question and just type in whatever you feel is your home country. It could be the country you're currently, you know, living in. Um, if that feels like home, it could be um, whatever kind of country. We just wanted to get a sense of um, where everybody who's here is from and be able to kind of see that in a visual way. So um, here we see, awesome. Thank you all for participating. Um, we'll give it a moment and we'll kind of see um, the way the word cloud works is uh, the largest kind of uh, countries there are the ones that have the most people kind of writing that in. So please take a moment and just follow the link from that. Okay, maybe one more moment. Anybody else? All right. So, wow. We could really see kind of the global. I wish this could actually show a map um, figure, which would be even more exciting. But um, just to see here that we've got people coming from many different countries and not only many countries, but a number of continents uh, with the SRI meeting being set in South Africa. Um, it's very exciting to have so many people here from South Africa, but also um, makes sense is multiple people from Mexico, but also Taiwan, Uruguay, Canada, Panama, Argentina, Italy, Zimbabwe, um, Chile, Germany. So really, um, really exciting to see that. Okay, now that you've become a kind of Slido um, expert, you know, Jamaica, fantastic. Um, we're gonna do um, the next poll question. Um, how comfortable or experienced are you with transdisciplinary science? Um, let me see here. Um, let's see that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so. Ah, perfect. Getting the live. Um, Fantastic. This is helpful for us too, just to get kind of a sense of um, where people are on kind of the spectrum of um, transdisciplinary expertise coming in as kind of a beginner, which this is a foundation. So that's fantastic. Maybe you know a little bit about transdisciplinarity, but you're hungry to learn more. Um, and then we even have some people who are TV experts, uh, which is fantastic. We would love to hear from you as well. Please be active um, in the discussion. And then also people who have actually done some transdisciplinary um, research, conducted transdisciplinary science. So um, most of us know a little bit, but want to know more um, or are beginners. And we have one final Slido poll and um, that is our last question. We get it to get a sense of the languages um, that are kind of dominant, and that will help us too. Because in the breakout rooms, we want to make sure that everybody's in a room where they feel kind of comfortable with the language being spoken, ideally. So, um, yeah, let's see this one is active. Okay. Excellent. Great. So it looks like pretty much everybody feels comfortable with English, at least as, as one of the language choices. A lot of Spanish speakers, um, Portuguese, and French. And I'm sure there's other languages as well, but um, these are kind of the ones that we have. Um, folks able to <laughs> engage in. All right. Well, thank you for, for sharing um, through the poll as well as uh, the more information that's going into the chat. Um, this is helpful as we move forward. So now that we're done with the housekeeping, I'm going to transition into our first part of the content. Um, we're going to introduce transdisciplinary research, and then we'll have a break for breakout rooms, and then we'll come back with more content, and then we'll have a final kind of closing discussion, so we have a roadmap of where we're going. And I'm going to turn it over to Gabriella. Your audio session. Unfortunately, I think we can only hear you when you're on interpretation still. So if everyone switches to the English channel, since it looked like everybody could speak English, this isn't perfect, but perhaps at least to get the presentation started while we're still looking around in the back end here, we could all hear Gabriella. And if you're wondering where that is, it's on the right hand side at the bottom. So there's the little leave button, but beside that there's an interpretation button. If you switch it to English, at least to get uh, the presentation going that will get us through the beginning and we're still working on it in the back end love lovely uh, the joys of learning about how to use things uh, a little bit as we go. Again, thank you for your patience.
here. Um, oh, I see it's going automatically. So we're going to use um, Jamboards here in a um, discussion in breakout rooms. And I just wanted to show people what the kind of Jamboard interface looks like before we go into the breakout rooms. There will be moderators in the breakout rooms and you can always um, hit the button, ask for help, and one of us can, can go over there. But um, basically, there will be a link that I'll put into the chat. And um, what you can do in a Jamboard is, or these are some of the most popular kind of features. Um, one is the sticky note. So you'll see this kind of list of tools on the left-hand side. Um, and the fourth button down on that list of tools is a sticky note. And so it's very easy to open a sticky note. You can change the color, yellow, green, blue, et cetera, and uh, type your thought as you know your answer to the question as a sticky note. Or maybe the answer to the question is another question, um, which also is a good question, but sticky notes are good to go. Um, also, you know, visual um, imagery, if you know, you can think of an image or something like that, that you think uh, will illustrate your point or what you're thinking about. That's fantastic. Um, definitely that kind of creativity that might arise. So you can add an image using the little kind of tool that looks like a picture. Um, and then the last tool, um, well, another tool that's popular, you can of course play with any of these is uh, to add a text box, if you want to write something that way. So um, basically play around um, with the tools on the left hand side, but those three tend to be kind of the most, um, the most popular. And okay, so I am going to put this uh, direct link to the Jamboards into the um, into the chat, and then we are going to um, assign everyone into a breakout room. There will be a total of five breakout rooms. There'll be about ten people per breakout room, um, and we have two questions that this kind of um, discussion will focus on It'll be about 10 minutes in the discussion um, in the breakout room and then we're going to have a share back and so for the share back what we're going to ask is when you join your breakout room um, choose someone or please someone volunteer to be the team lead and what the team lead is going to do is they're going to be brave and they will summarize the discussion when we do the full group share out. And what I will do is I'll share your Jamboard so that you know everybody can see it. Um, and then you know you can use the Jamboard to help you with your um, kind of summary or with your comments. And the share out is just two minutes, so it's going to be brief so that we can get through each um, each team in about ten minutes, and then we'll move on to more content. Um, but please choose a team lead or someone volunteer. Um, and the two questions will be one, who's not about the project counts, to whom and under what condition? So really thinking about what Gabriella was talking about in terms of um, TV, this kind of decentering um, and unlearning, the rebalancing of power. So thinking about you know knowledge here. And then second, what challenges and opportunities do you see in centralizing research and sharing decentralizing research and sharing power and collaboration so this is just a place to think throw ideas up um and chat kind of amongst the group but please do add to the jamboard because that's a good way as well um to kind of help your team lead to have um things to report back on uh, to the group so I'm going to go out of the full screen. I'm going to put this link to the Jamboard in the chat, and then we're going to assign um, people into the breakout room. So, Lily, can you hear me? Yes. Yay! <laughs> okay. So I'm sorry. I just there's one question in the chat saying, "Can you make a simple example of answer to question number one?" So I'm gonna try one. So whose knowledge about the project counts? to whom and under what conditions. So let's think about a research life cycle, right? Like we, 
we sit down and we start thinking about a project and then we engage with whoever is going to be part of our team and then we have perhaps you know like the actual process of research so in any of those stages who's involved and when we say who, whose knowledge count you're saying who's making the decisions who's defining the problem to be addressed Was that helpful? Um, yeah, and Gabriella, can you do the same for question two? Can you give some concrete, like real world examples from some of your projects about what you mean by decentralizing research and sharing power? What challenges and opportunities did you see in decentralizing research? So I, I just share an example with you in line two of, of the table that I presented being um, if only, okay, so in our team, if we decide what the research question we're going to address and how we are going to address it, we are prioritizing specific methodological approaches. So our, our team needed to discuss, okay, so where are you coming from? What type of research do you do? Quantitative, qualitative? Do you do uh, uh, research that assumes that there is like an, a, a reality out there that needs to be discover, is there data out there that you need to, need to be extracted or uh, a different positionality? And that decenters academia in the sense that it questions the ways we approach our work. Was that helpful? Yes. Fantastic, perfect. Okay, thank you, Lily. Yes, thank you. Um, Danny, um, I just, this chat, trying to confirm individual chats. I don't have host privileges. Um, yeah, neither do I, so I can't add to, yeah, neither do I. Um, for the breakout rooms, I don't know if somebody could open those. Um, yes, I'm opening the breakout rooms now. So all of you have been classified by the, also the, the, the language you preferred, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent. So you should get a pop-up note that says uh, to join a room. Please take note of which room you're going to, if it's room one or room two or room three, because you'll see. Um, you have been invited now to your breakout rooms. So please yeah. just join the breakout rooms. Oh, Let us know if you're having any trouble going into a breakout room. Okay. Irene, can you hear me? You have been assigned to a breakout room. Hola, Did Fanny. Sí, te decía que oh, en realidad. Okay. I will, um, I'll put all of the breakout room links in the chat here. Sorry, I thought I would be a host. So I realized I didn't have You are not? You are. Let me see. Um, no, I'm not. Okay, we're going to break out room one. Sorry, we would have to be on this with me. You are, no, I think. No, you are not. 
it's okay. I don't want to get the, I don't want to mess up the sound again, but um, I'll just do the. Are there people in all of the breakout rooms? Even though, oh no, there's only yeah. three breakout rooms. And it looks like only Gabriella, there's only, okay, two people in the first room. Uh, yeah, because there were like five people uh, who wanted to join in, in Spanish. And uh, Gabriela is in that session, in that breakout. Okay. Although they're all okay, finished because I'm not dropping. And the breakouts will end in. Um, Fanny, are you able to go to breakout room and give them the link? I can't, I don't have the way, I'm not able to go there. I posted all the, the, the links to all of them. Didn't you get them? I don't know. I just went in, I was only able to go into the first room and I gave them the draft link, but I can't, I'm not a host, I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> Hopefully it's okay, but um okay, you should be in the room three. Uh where are you now? It's it's okay. Um I guess for next time we'll see. Okay. Um let's see. Oh no, breakout room three has it. They're fine. It's breakout room two. I think they don't have the the link. And I, I don't know how to go in there. Just I thought it was going to be a home. I think it planned differently than how it came because of the technical issues. But I don't have a way to get into. I send you to the breakout room too. Is that okay? Oh wait, yeah. Um, yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you.
gosh. Amanda. Hello, hi. They are in the breakout rooms now. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was on the phone with my career coach, so I wasn't able to jump off. But I, 
Um, did everything work out okay? I was just wondering about the recording. This is just recording this, right? The, the main room. <laughs> yeah, so who's ever, in the, who's ever in the breakout room? Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> they would have to be recording in the breakout room. I think everyone is back. Yes, I think everyone's back. Okay, um, so we actually have just uh, three breakout rooms. So we're going to um, share, okay, all slides so that um, from each breakout so that whoever is the um, team lead, can use those to help kind of structure uh, your share back, but it would be great to hear a little bit about the conversations that were happening in the different rooms or, you know, what has gone on the jam board around these two questions. So I'm going to share and, um, wow. All right. Is someone from breakout room one um, want to be the team lead and share their discussion. That was us. Was that, yeah. Was that Hector? Oh uh, yeah, I can jump in. Sorry about awesome. that. <laughs> so um we we're talking about I mean that was our group is in Spanish. Is it okay if I speak English or should I move to Spanish? Is that okay? Uh, so we talk about uh, the different uh, types of knowledge um, that are considered in these transdisciplinary projects. And we talk about the local actors and how somehow uh, that type of knowledge should shape the way we do our projects, you know, from the objectives on, because those are the ones that, um, you know, leave the problems, you know, in their communities. But we also talk about the role of funding agencies, the role of universities, and how many times uh, that those agencies shape the way researchers do their projects and go about their projects. So they set up times, sometimes they set up, you know, the problems and those, and that situation like enters in conflict with what the locals need and the timing uh, of, of the solutions and of the processes that uh, are implemented there. So I think that was like a very a brief synthesis of question one. And about question two, we just uh, talked about, you know, the timing and how many times uh, we or, or the funding agencies or the universities have their own times and the solutions in the local communities, uh, you know, demand other times. So how we can make that conversation and that dialogue uh, between the uh, the times of the agencies and the times in which local communities need these problems to be solved or they need a solution. And also, we also talk about how we could integrate like, or how we can create projects and transdisciplinary projects that uh, in which the aid, the funding agency, the researchers and the communities can talk to each other to set up the requirements and the lines of inquiry that and the problems that we want to target. I think that was pretty much everything that we had time to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. That was excellent. Um, breakout room two, 
hopefully you can see the slide here. Um, Lila, was that? No, I could jump in to try to okay. translate a little bit the discussion we had at breakout room two. Uh, one interesting aspect is that we started by discussing uh, maybe a little bit differently than the question that was posed, those, whose knowledge about the project counts, but whose knowledge about the project should count, right? So we populated a lot this side of the, of the gym board uh, relating to people, to those affected by research, the most vulnerable, the indigenous populations, knowledge, knowledge keepers, uh, stakeholders of the project and so on. So the, the idea is like to, to address the most fundamental idea of TD, right? So to recognize uh, what those that are involved in the, the projects could, uh, um, how they could be really um, incorporated to uh, the research or the project. And then we talked a little bit also about uh, the knowledges that are normally uh, Western-centered and science that are normally more uh, legitimate in those processes. And in Jambar number two, uh, we have discussed uh, challenges and opportunities. Then again, we populated a lot the, the the challenges side. And uh, similarly to uh, the, the insights from group one, uh, the frameworks for calls and funding initiatives and publishing and the colonial model uh, really do frame how uh, the projects can move on and what projects can apply and get the grants to, to pursue its objectives and the problems related to traditional academic model focused on single PIs and this idea that one person generates the knowledge, right? So this is the, the author issue here as well. And as opportunities, um, uh, there were many aspects uh, that we couldn't really discuss that much, uh, but uh, bringing arts and humanities was a big one. Uh, innovation and social legitimacy to address the colonial approaches and training non-academic art uh, actors also to engage in research processes. So I think in a nutshell, this is what we discussed in group two. Excellent, thank you so much for summary and breakout room three. Wow, I love the guy. Somebody in your group uh, the team lead or willing to uh, summarize the discussion? Please feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, anyone who was in group room? Yeah, that, what, that was my group. Um... I think it was Funga, no? Were you, were, were you just put, I think she was going to present unless I misunderstood. Yes, she was. Are you here, Fungo? Not seeing her here. She's on the third page. Oh. So she should be here. Yeah. Cool. That's weird. Would anyone from that group like to step forward and just? Um, yes, yes, I can sure. step in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, group number three. We, we had a discussion on uh, whose knowledge about the project counts to whom and under what conditions. Um, just like the other two groups, um, the, question of the community members, um, stakeholders, whether they're in corporate, whether they're in uh, non-government organizations, whether they're in government, 
the knowledge is important for the operations because all of them, they are pulling strings to make life better for the citizens. And therefore, uh, in our group, we, we also realized that um, it is also critical um, uh, to involve uh, actors uh, from both the economic uh, sector, political sector, and uh, using the epistemological um, you know, basis, it's good to ensure that this knowledge is packaged well uh, for use by all these groups. And we, we also say that um, our Western knowledge systems are usually preferred, are preferred and there is a need to, uh, to really bring in uh, knowledge also from other perspectives and other cultures. Um, on the side of, uh, you know, legitimacy of the knowledge, uh, unless uh, this knowledge is core conceptualized, uh, it is defined by all uh, stakeholders, it may not be useful because the, um, the, the end result is supposed to, uh, to be applied. So application may, uh, you know, face some challenges if there is no legitimacy. Like if we say this knowledge belongs to the government, the local communities will not take it up. Uh, the, the issue of urgency, um, demanding uh, solutions, uh, demanding answers into pressing issues, uh, whether it is climate change, whether it is issue to do with the uh, biological uh, extinction of species and so many other challenges, we, we really need to, to look into that. And also power relations, uh, power relations is also very important because we need to have a, you know, a level, a playing ground for all the stakeholders so that people don't feel as if this knowledge belongs to this group and so forth. So this is what um, uh, we, we mentioned about uh, uh, this question. Thank you. Yes, uh, on question number two, um, the challenges um, that faces um, the decentralization of research and sharing power in collaboration, as well as the opportunities that we see. Uh, one is the challenges epistemic, relativism instead of epistemic justice. And here uh, we, we look at uh, how people, you know, different perspectives and different interpretations. In, in terms of core ownership of ideas, uh, processes and solutions, people who see themselves reflected in the work being done. Again, uh, this is, um, could be, it, it can be uh, an opportunity uh, because if we reflect ourselves in the knowledge that is being generated, then this becomes an opportunity to decentralize research. Uh, but if it doesn't, on the other side, it can be also a challenge uh, because by the end of the day, it will not uh, accelerate the pace at which we want to decentralize research. Um, the need to be listening uh, to each voice uh, coming from different quarters, sometimes uh, that means creating safe space for people who aren't normally allowed or encouraged to speak. And especially in, in forums like what we have, uh, the SRI 2022, uh, there are groups that just sit back to listen to what is happening. And this is, uh, can be a challenge uh, because by sitting back means that uh, probably some of them, they don't agree with what is going on. And only this is reflected at the stage of implementation, as I mentioned in question number one. So this can be a challenge. And therefore the opportunity is where uh, SRI um, has gone to an extent of ensuring that all groups they are represented and they are given space. And especially in this SRI 2022, I see um, diversity in terms of the sessions that have been uh, that are being presented and that are um, being, you know, executed, that they represent different groups and they represent different voices. And this is a, is a strength uh, 
uh, that is going to help us to decentralize research and create a stronger collaboration for the future. It can be difficult for some to uh, relinquish control and share the plot to others uh, to other views and opinion that might not always reflect their own. This is, it is hand pill. It is, we, we can say it is bitter pill to swallow, especially for those people who have already uh, been to this culture of top down where you give uh, you know, orders and people have to follow. And because this is being broken down by uh, this transdisciplinary research. And therefore it is a challenge to, con uh, to convince maybe a prime minister to sit down and to listen to a local person on what they have to say about research and um, into issues that are affecting them. And I, and I think discovering this, that communities has the answers um, and, 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 and in most cases they have to, uh, to, to, to be part of the process from the beginning to the end um, becomes pertinent for, for us uh, in all our sectors that we present. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, but that was a fantastic summary. And um, you're gonna see reflected now in the next part, we're gonna go back to the slides. Um, some of these ideas, especially around co-production, but I love this idea of co-ownership as well. I think that's really important. So give me one moment. We're gonna pull up uh, the slides here and move forward with. While well, Lily is pulling up her slides, I'm just, uh, I feel I should tell everybody that I wish you were all here joining us in South Africa. They're setting up this crazy barbecue set up beside me. Um, it's too bad we can't have more of you with us. I'm sure it would have been really cool to meet you all in person. Those of you who are here in person, you should definitely stop by and say hello when you have a chance. If you run into me, not that you can tell with my mask, but maybe. <laughs> um, sorry, it's starting to load. Okay, so um, I wish I I wish I was there in South Africa meeting everyone. Um, Moving into part two, so now we're talking a little bit about doing transdisciplinary research, and then we're going to move into part three, applying transdisciplinary research, and then we'll have a closing discussion with this one final um, question. So that's kind of where we're going here for the last 35 minutes of our session. Um, so as a nice segue, because we had Peter talking about his group um, and this idea of co-ownership, but also of um, making sure the communities are there through all parts of this process, um, not just brought in at the very, very beginning or at the very end, which is what we see in a lot of traditional research, unfortunately. And so I really like this quote from Sheila Jasanoff's work um, on the co-production of knowledge, where she says, the ways in which we know and represent the world, both nature and society, are inseparable from the ways in which we choose to live in it. Scientific knowledge both embeds is in, and is embedded in social practices, identities, norms, conventions, discourse, instruments, and institutions. So here we see um, that a lot of, kind of what came out of that first discussion, um, also this idea of kind of epistemic relativism, um, that was a really sophisticated discussion um, just to come out of the kind of introducing but I think we see it here in this need for co-production of knowledge. And in the scholarship, co-production of knowledge is increasingly referenced as a best practice approach for collaborative transdisciplinary. And I think what a lot of us are probably interested in is transformative action-oriented research. So um, doing science, doing the best science, but making sure that science goes towards right some kind of action or transformative end. 
And um, in the US, the National Science Foundation also talks about co-production as the integration of different knowledge systems and methodologies to systematically understand the phenomena, systems, and processes um, being studied. And so that kind of takes us into another kind of key part of uh, trinary research, which is the need for integration. And here it's really important, and this also is what, to me and to our team, having um, been doing transdisciplinary research now for almost 10 years, that it's more than just working in parallel. I think a lot of kind of multidisciplinary research had disciplines often working in parallel. So here are the ecologists, here are the social scientists, engineers, um, here are the urban planners. And everyone is kind of doing their own thing. And then maybe they get together and talk about what they found. But there isn't a true kind of integration and recombination and kind of emergence of innovative um, and kind of novel things coming out of that. It's rather more kind of working in parallel. And so rather than that form, what um, transdisciplinarity requires is really thinking about how we interact communicate and recombine the different types of disciplinary approaches to produce novel theory, methodology, and synthesis. Um, and so what this is really important is that we're not just adding, it's not just additive, like anthropology plus ecology plus marine biology. It's in fact something more than that. Um, and what we're actually trying to do is create kind of new understanding through a synergistic and kind of a way of transforming our traditional understanding. And so how do you do that, right? It sounds really good, but um, integration can be difficult. And so we've been doing, um, we've done literature review and tried to understand from the scholarship, you know, how is uh, transdisciplinary integration uh, conducted? What does this look like? Well, it can be at the theoretical level of thinking about maybe at the front end of the project, right? What is the unifying principle theory or set of questions, right? That's going to provide the coherence for the project. And with the idea that going back to the discussion, that those principles, theories, and such as questions aren't just coming from, say, the academic researchers or the ministers or something like that level, but also we're being in a co generated right with the um, communities on the ground right and, and part of that whole ownership and buy-in happening even in, you know at the beginning of the project that you're kind of creating it together um and that goes into the second point there of co-generation of the research questions and the design um really happening in a meaningful way and that's where at the beginning some of this integration can begin um, and we'll show an example actually from one of our research projects here in a moment. Um, also really thinking about our epistemologies and our knowledge systems, recognizing right this epistemic relativism that came up in the last discussion, recognizing that Western science is not the only epistemology, the dominant or the best epistemology, which is how a lot of previous science has been done, but really trying to understand what are the multiple knowledge systems and value systems um, that are present and those speak to each other and how can right they be kind of combined and recombined to actually get to something more novel. Um, also, we found really important, and uh, so is the uh, literature, mutual learning um, within teams, acquiring a common language amongst the team which often means, you know, learning together, learning the methodology together, learning theory together, reading together and discussing, right? So really doing that work um, together in a team and that, that mutual learning also helps develop these other really important soft skills in transdisciplinarity. So ideas like trust, right? Um, trust often and kind of feelings of friendship, um, these emotional kind of feelings we might not talk about in research, but actually we found are really important for team cohesion. And they're really important when teams face a conflict, right? When all of a sudden people are fighting or they don't agree, that having those other soft skills that are like trusting each other, um, other positive kind of emotional responses among team members, that mutual learning can be a really important way to foster that 
um, managing and nurturing internal communication. And um, Marcia Lee is going to talk more about you know, communication and her case study um, and project in a little bit. But really having a communication strategy and one that can follow your project um, throughout. Um, also, right, coming up with kind of these shared methodologies, common interpretations, creating common ground without, within a team. And then, you know, once you have data, once you have findings, how are you going to kind of integrate, right, the data, the research findings, and hopefully not just combine, but actually kind of recombine your research results. Um, so these are some of the, I would say, oftentimes can be challenging parts of transdisciplinarity, these, you know, integration um, from the theoretical level you know, through to kind of your methodology, your data, your findings, but also are the places where transdisciplinarity holds immense potential. Um, because this is where I think really kind of the novel solutions, the new ways of thinking that we really need and going back to some ideas and thinking about um, this um, uh, fabrics of life. Um, so how can we weave together, right, all of these kind of across all of this difference to really kind of come up with um, this, the solution-based science that we're hopefully moving forward. And a um, example of this that we have found helpful is boundary objects. And actually, boundary objects have been in the literature since the 80s, but um, continue to be uh, a really good tool to think through some of this ways of kind of integrating. And so the ways that uh, Starr and Greismeyer talk about boundary objects back in 1989 are that artifacts have this common shared meaning, right? And so if you can find these areas, right, these objects that have shared meaning, this provides potential to support kind of coordination and integration. And I'm going to show a very specific example in the next slide. So boundary objects can capture the possibility of cooperative work, especially in the absence of consensus. And this is something in transdisciplinary um, science that's important, is we might not have consensus. We might not even necessarily want to force consensus, right? Difference and diversity are actually really important parts of transdisciplinarity. And so what we're more interested in is, right, cooperation and this kind of emergence, right, of, of our findings and of our knowledge, not necessarily forcing it into this really narrow area of consensus. Uh, recently, right, people have found that boundary objects can be really helpful when we're working in kind of unfamiliar activities. Um, and that boundary crossing itself, right, involves negotiating and combining ingredients from different contexts. So one of the kind of uh, central importance to collaborative transdisciplinary work is this common relative relevant knowledge um, that we can use to work together. And so what is this actually kind of conceptual? What does this actually look like? So this slide shows a grounded kind of example. Um, Gabriella and I and her colleagues have been working on a project. And we actually have some people here uh, who have been grad graduate student assistants on our project um, and key members. That is across three countries um, in Latin America and in Uruguay, Chile, and Colombia. And we have different case studies in each country, though the kind of main focus or concept here is thinking about how we can integrate local and traditional knowledge systems um, to improve biodiversity conservation implementation at the local scale. So how do we improve right, our biodiversity conservation outcomes? Well, the cases are very different. The social cultural context might be different. The ecological context right, might be different. And so we wanted to think about right, how can we integrate across what we're seeing in these different case studies um, and begin to do more of this kind of true combining and recombining right of knowledge. And so we actually went through a process, a larger research team, uh, where we had short case study presentations. So each team had an opportunity for about 30 minutes about their case. And then each person present identified three to five key words that they saw come out of their case. And then we used actually a social network analysis tool of those keywords that were generated 
And we created the um, map that you can see here, this kind of uh, social network map. And we found that there were actually three key boundary objects that connected the three case studies. And those were power asymmetries and plurality. So that began a really interesting discussion with our larger research teams. You can think about 10, 12 teams sitting around. We then spent a whole afternoon with each of us kind of sharing our own theoretical, conceptual, as well as experiential understanding of these three key areas of conflict, right? Power asymmetry um, and plurality. We found that there's so many theories of power. Right, so this really allowed us to have an extremely rich discussion to see how people come to the table with very different knowledge, um, et cetera. And so this is one of the kinds of examples here that um, that we found very helpful for kind of thinking about knowledge integration. Forward, um, we're going to move into applying transdisciplinary research. I'm going to start and then pass um, on to Marsha Lee. And so. Here we begin the kind of process of implementation. So we do the transdisciplinary science. So how do we apply this? How do we implement this? And another finding um, from our past transdisciplinary research is this really important need, not just you know in kind of science policy translation, but also then translating or transforming that science and policy into action on the ground. And we will kind of identified this need to move from knowledge extension to knowledge application. And knowledge extension is maybe the more traditional way that you know, knowledge has been kind of disseminated. Uh, we extend scientific knowledge to our stakeholders, to our decision makers, um, and hope that it gets integrated into public policy, right? We maybe synthesize our scientific findings and we try to produce something usable and kind of pass it along into um, the policy or the implementation sphere. Well, moving in science teams into knowledge application really means actually thinking about how is that knowledge able to be applied on the ground, right? What would this look like? Um, what are the kind of local solutions and how can you orient towards those? Um, and so here teams are really challenged. I, I think this is a challenge of meeting teams to provide knowledge that's specifically useful to those local communities, to those social actors and on the ground stakeholders, as well as your high level policy makers and other decision makers to really kind of create the conditions that transformative change. And we have identified actually through another large research project looking at um, a number of about 23 transdisciplinary teams um, that there are actually a few variables that are important um, for having knowledge application outcomes. And that's more likely in collaborative teams that have high member diversity. So having members that come from multiple different backgrounds, um, not just having all academics, they're all you know, scientists from a certain type of discipline or, but having a really diverse team, distributing leadership. So some of that power sharing, right? Not having a super hierarchical, but rather a more distributed and horizontal um, kind of leadership. Doing things like joint training um, or other activities like the boundary objects one, so that you share cognition. Not that everybody thinks the same way or you have consensus, but rather that everyone kind of has a, view or, you know, an understanding of how the other person thinks. Um, and then that you have trust built into your team so that those times when things get a little bumpy, you trust each other and that um, it can also help for the team to have previous experience working together. So these are some variables that have emerged from, from research. And um, also thinking about having kinds of chains of results um, or that kind of allow you to move through your action research stage and actually thinking about it as action research um, should be iterative. So something that you know you create up front, it may need to change. And in our kind of <laughs> current world, it likely will need to change. But really thinking about um, what are the different stages of the project and how stakeholders and communities and others are going to be integrated in each phase 
and how those different stages are going to kind of talk to each other and what your final outcome as well, um, your transformative outcome is hoping to be. So also thinking maybe to come back for planning. Um, so really keeping those solutions oriented and those outcomes um, as, as key, right? So that we're creating science that has that kind of um, uh, And now I'm gonna turn it over. Marsha Lee, um, we're gonna talk about Jawick and then Marcy will also be talking on Thursday about Jawick as well. So if you're interested, uh, please come to that session to learn um, even more. Hi everyone. Uh, so we'll just continue by giving a real life example of TD in action. Um, and we decided to use JAWIC because most of our objectives are aligned and we execute our projects using um, TD. And just a bit of background on JAWIC or Jamaican Women in Coffee. This is a registered Jamaican charitable organization and we are a local chapter of the International Women's Coffee Alliance. And we are one of 30 chapters in the world that share the common mission just to empower the lives of women in the coffee industry. We do this by developing and nurturing the community. We use our collective strength to, cat to catalyze um, positive change within the coffee industry because we have sensed that there is the need for some amount of change within the, the coffee space, not just in Jamaica, but globally, we have decided to come together to develop programs for women in the coffee space. Um, Jawit provides for all its members a vehicle for channeling resources to affiliated coffee communities globally, a meeting point for women to network, share their experiences, and deliberate over issues of mutual interest, a platform for women to develop their leadership and entrepreneurial skills, and also a channel to market women's coffees. Thanks, Lily. Can next slide, please? So that's our overall mission. So we do this. Um, so there are a few systemic issues occurring in the Jamaican coffee industry. And we realized that to tackle these issues, we needed to develop few initiatives, some key initiatives that will allow us to tackle the problems specifically and not try to just go in trying to fix everything at once. So we actively pursue solutions to challenges, these systemic issues that are facing the industry, which it doesn't make sense I go into because there are so many of them. We decided to just pursue solutions for each of these issues by coining our field survey initiative that seeks to identify these women know what they want and know how we can serve them. We have a quality control initiative that looks to how we can improve the quality of the coffee from farm to cup. We have the market access initiative, which ensures that once that good quality coffee is ready, then we will have accessible markets for the women. Then there's sustainability, ensuring that the practices are both economic, socially and environmentally sustainable. And then we look at our leadership initiative, which seeks to build leadership within the community, give the women a voice in policy. We can go ahead and slowly. All right, so we started this organization in about 2018. And of, of course I mentioned that we have quite a few initiatives that we're engaged in, that we have coined. However, we've decided to just take it one step at a time, starting with the field survey initiative, because this initiative we saw important in understanding who these women are and what they want from us. You may have heard earlier on that it's important that you involve the community so that the results that are, the results that come from your activities, your projects, they are beneficial to the local community. So we wanted to know, okay, who are these women and how could we serve them? How do you want us to serve you? So we went into about three different communities and within the Blue Mountains, well, we went into three different regions in the Blue Mountains in over about 10 communities. And we conducted an initial baseline survey. And we call it our pilot survey because Jamaica is, we have about 4,200 farmers in the industry about 27% of those are women. 
And we could not capture all of that because this baseline pilot survey was self-funded by the members of JAWIC. So we decided to go very small and started with six to seven women in 2019 in the regions across the Blue Mountain. And we did an analysis on the challenges facing women. We designed a survey using Salesforce that basically ask some basic questions. Where are you from? How many, how many acres of farm do you have? What's your level of education? What are your challenges? What opportunities do you see are there? And we asked a myriad of questions just to get to know the farmers. And this also helped us to build a certain relationship with them, help them to understand who we are and what we're about. So you can see in these photos that we were actually out in the field, engaging with these women, talking to them. If we didn't have a central meeting space, we just met anywhere. We sat on some chairs outside, we were on some farms. It was a beautiful experience. And that also helped them to see that, hey, these women actually have our best interest at heart. So that was our initial way also of trying to get them to buy into what we're doing for them and let them know that we care about what they want. And we're not just coming in to give them something that we think they want. So throughout the survey, we realized that women continuously requested the need for resources and information and training to improve the quality of their coffee. Because one of the biggest issues we're having in the industry is the reduction in the quantity of coffee being produced by the farmers and output from the larger processors. So they wanted to receive, they wanted to produce more quantity and then they wanted a higher price for their coffees because the prices of coffee have dropped to about 50% to the farmers over the last five years. So they were seeking more for their coffee. They were seeking more resources. Thanks, Lily. All right, just, just some basic results. We realized that a large percentage of the women had never received training in coffee farming. So they just were going off their parents, what their parents teach them, they were self-taught. They had no idea of how to take care of their coffee farms based on the different challenges that exist within the farming space for coffee. They, a large percentage also indicated that their income is insufficient from coffee to fend for their livelihoods. So they were doing intercropping with other crops. They were selling cash crops. They had other employment outside of being a coffee farmer. So they couldn't pay much attention to the production of their farm because they had to be supplementing with other sources of income. And we also realized that a larger percentage, 52%, they were only at the secondary level education, right? And then we had a large percentage also, sorry, that were at the primary level education. All right, so we can go ahead. All right, so... The pilot survey was intended to give us the information that we needed to design our programs, not just for the field survey initiative, but also for all our initiatives. But, and then the intention was to get, get funding to replicate that pilot survey across the Blue Mountain and High Mountain region in Jamaica. However, we had a large challenge getting funding for baseline studies. No one wanted to fund that baseline study. This study has never been done in Jamaica before. No one understands who the women are in coffee, what they want, um, how many coffee they're farming, what kind of challenges they face. This study has never been done. And yet we still had challenges to get the funding to conduct this baseline study. So we, we decided to create a proposal, a project proposal to see if we could allow for the industry stakeholders to see the challenges that we face with not just the women in coffee, but then the industry itself. Um, we, wanted the, we wanted the policymakers to realize that there is an overall issue with the knowledge transfer and infrastructure um, in Jamaica as it relates to training in coffee and that was what was reducing the production 
amounts for the women. So we decided to write a proposal for a project called Strengthening the Capacity of Coffee, Women Coffee Farmers in Jamaica through training. And this project was successfully funded by the Canadian Fund for Local Initiatives in 2021. And that was based on the justification of the evidence collected from the pilot survey. So our justification for what we wanted to implement was based on the information that we got from that survey with the farmers. We have three different regions in Jamaica that planted coffee. So we decided to execute this project region by region. And that was also because we realized that the different region had slightly different challenges. They had different culture and different um, issues with access to a central area for training. We decided to group the trainings. So the first training was executed in St. Thomas of Jamaica. And then we, we have recently um, received funding this year to execute that same program as a phase two in another region called St. Andrew. So there's St. Andrew, there's St. Thomas, and there's Portland. So we have executed in St. Thomas. Now we have gotten funded to execute in St. Andrew, and then we'll go next to Portland. Can go ahead, Lily, thank you. We're gonna have to wrap up in a few minutes. So sure. uh, I learned that it will automatically close on us. So maybe right. I'll, I'll go, yeah. I'll go quickly. <laughs> Um, so, as Lee mentioned earlier, I'll go quickly, um, we communicated with the farmers throughout the project. So in the initiation phase, we collaborated with them on a, what you call a sensitization session. So we found out more about what kind of training material they would want, right? Find out how we could deliver information to them, what specifically did they want, and they gave us that information. Um, you can go ahead, Lily. So after that sensitization session, then we moved to implementation because there were there was space in between the sensitization and the execution. So the sensitization gave the farmers a voice in development of the solutions, the training material, and it also built their confidence in um, ownership of the project deliverables. Um, we also got production experts to come in, and we also got farmers to network amongst themselves. Um, within the different communities just to share their experiences. Can go ahead. All right, so the final outputs, we had 35 women farmers engaged in the training sessions in sustainable farming practices, soil management, harvesting, disease management. They were heavily engaged in the, in the training, sharing their own experiences and knowledge. And then we had the agronomists also learning from the farmers about their practices, then applying the science to the practices that the farmers have executed. Um, can go ahead. A few more of our outputs. You can go ahead, um, Lily. A few more of our outputs. We had women being selected as leaders for the group. Um, they represented the community at a meet and greet at the Canadian Embassy. We had a video storytelling activity done for the women. We had an icon-based record keeping booklet so that the women can record their um, activities to improve their processes going forward. We gave them participation certificates and then we received additional funding for a larger project, a larger project that will allow the industry stakeholders to now recognize the need for improving the infrastructure surrounding training and um, knowledge transfer in coffee production throughout the value chain, starting with the farmers. So we have also, we, we will also execute a monitoring evaluation, um, monitoring and evaluation activity to find out how the training has benefited the women and how they have improved their practices from that training. And we'll use that information to improve the next activity that we'll be implementing. Thank All you right. so much, Marsha Lee. That's um, such an interesting case study. And um, <laughs> we, uh, we are going to get kind of closed upon in, in about four minutes. So we're not gonna be able to go into the breakout room, but our closing discussion was um, going to be to ask, uh, so maybe you can kind of take this question uh, with you, 
what key aspects of transdisciplinary research uh, do you see in the study case example from uh, Jaw with Jamaican women in um, coffee? Because a lot of what uh, the process, the protocols um, that Marsha Lee and her team are utilizing kind of follow, right, many of the um, these kind of tenants that we've been sharing, but also going back to our first breakout room um, discussion, share many of the things that all of you shared um, in the Jamboards and in your discussion um, summaries. So kind of seeing those in action. Um, and this is our kind of final slide here. So I just wanna thank everyone so much uh, for being here with us today. Um, and I hope that you learned something kind of new about transdisciplinarity. Um, we would love you to think about, you know, what new things you learned in this, or questions you might have, advantages or challenges of engaging in this kind of work. And we invite you to come on Wednesday to see uh, more about our different case studies. And definitely, if you can, to come on Thursday for part two of this, um, this session which will focus on a number of really interesting cases, including research in the Arctic, research, uh, other research in Latin America. Um, and so kind of seeing this across really diverse contexts as well and how different teams are putting transdisciplinarity in action to face some of our you know, key global challenges. So um, and this, we'll go back here and I think we're gonna be closed out upon in a, in a moment. If anyone has a last word, Hi, Lily. Just wanted to thank you guys for this fantastic session and to remind everyone to join us for the TD part two, which will be on Thursday. I'm not going to say the time because the time zone will, will vary by everybody, but we will have a two hour session with case studies from around the world to do a deeper dive into these topics that were presented today. And we really hope the rest of you can join us there. All right. And those of you in South Africa, please find Nicole and Fanny and um talk to them about TV as well. All right. Thank you, Solena, and thank you, Lourdes, for the interpretation. All right, yes. thanks, everyone.